Today, I am interviewing David Gosnell. David Gosnell is one of the top shelf shooters in, in F-Class. Uh, he has been national champion. He has multiple national records to his name. Uh, he has gold medals from the world championships. I mean, this guy is, like I said, a very, very good shooter. So uh, we're going to talk to him, and I know you guys can learn something from him because he is, like I said, a top-level shooter, and he has been for a long time. So anyway, let's uh, talk to him and see what we can learn from him. Again, don't forget to like and subscribe. David, how you doing, man? Doing good. Thank you so much for doing this. Uh, of course, you're with Team Burger. Um, I already introduced you uh, multiple national records, national championships, Burger. You won the Burger as well, right? You pretty yes. much you won everything. Just might as well. Well, what trying happened to. You won? Trying, huh? <laughs> well. What haven't you won? You pretty much won everything, right? Well, there's some state championships I haven't won that I would like to, like Texas. I haven't won Texas. Oh, anybody can win that. Well, well, <laughs> obviously, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, I still keep going down there and trying, but, you know, something yeah. always happens. Uh, and, you know, I, I, it's, I'm probably not the one to talk about this, but Texas is a hard one to win. People don't realize how hard it is to win down there just because of the people that show up over there. Well, yeah, I mean, a monthly, uh, just the regular monthly match at Bayou is is pretty chock full of high-end shooters. I mean, even yeah. a monthly match is hard to win there. Yeah, I, I, that was my longest, you know, just my kind of my goal to win Texas. And then, I don't know, man, one day I just finally managed to win it and then it just clicked from there on. But it's it's uh, every time I come off out of there with a win, I, I I don't even know how, you know what I mean? Because I it, yeah. it's anybody's anybody can win. I mean, like you said, you know, I, I've talked about this before, but you go to buy your rifle club. Like you said, even a club match is extremely hard to win. But when you go to Texas State Championship, you have to beat at least half a dozen national champions record holders yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah yeah <laughs> it's crazy but anyway uh so yeah i mean uh texas is, is a hard one but there's there's just people don't realize it's it's not the game it's the competition it's who shows up that day that makes yeah. it tough right yep because you yep. know the the equipment that we have um uh, if you have a calm day eh, it's fairly easy to shoot cleans but so is the guy next to you exactly and the other guy and the other guy and they're not all gonna mess up exactly exactly <laughs> so so let's go let's go to the beginning let's let's how do you get into f class well this was back in like 2005 or so i i hadn't been shooting for years and i had bought a gun and decided i wanted to try some kind of competition and it was kind of a weird thing i was searching the internet for information. I had no idea what kind of competition I wanted to do. And I found a picture of a guy that I went to high school with. We played on the golf team together. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen in 20 years. And it turned out he had been a member of the 2003, I believe, uh, U.S. Palma team. So I, got, I tracked him down, which for, that was good for a couple of reasons, but he, he's the one that told me about F-Class. And that sounded better because I didn't like the idea of looking through iron sights. Mm -hmm. I figured a scope would be better. So I, I had a, an old gun and rebarreled it in 308. And I shot FTR for about the first year down at Bayou. That's, I lived in Houston at the time. And, uh, and then got, a, got an open gun and kind of went from there. I went to my first nationals in 2007 at uh, Raton, shot the Spirit of America and and. Uh, nationals there and then it's just been uh throwing money in that hole ever since <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know i was thinking about this when i when i first started it must have been about 2008 and i started i was a hunter and i started going to colorado elk hunting and then i realized i need to learn how to shoot long range so I started kind of like you looking around and asking, and I found out there's a little club in New Braunfels, Texas that, that shoots 500 yards. I know. I was there. Well, yeah. <laughs> I, I, 
<laughs> I went to lunch with you when, like, yep. my yep, first. Yeah, Jack Leather. Jack Leather, and, and I was just the kind of the new guy. I was just yeah. there. And, and, I remember. And I said, you know what? Uh, you know, a group of people were going to lunch, and I thought, I should probably just go and just sit there and listen. You know what I mean? And that's what I would do. I'd just sit there and listen uh, and just pick up little tips here and there. And, you know, every now and then I I would ask a question. But uh, kind of what I'm still doing now, it, it seems like. <laughs> yeah. Just picking people's brains, but anyway, yeah, that was interesting. Uh, you know, looking back, I, you know, just doesn't seem that long ago, but no, yeah, it's it's interesting. So so anyway, so so you get into F class, you go to the nationals, you start shooting FTR, now you move over to F Open, and uh, how did it go after that? Well, originally I was shooting a six BR, which is okay, but it's not going to hold up in the wind. And then I got into a 284. And uh, then I decided that I needed to join the U.S. team that was going to England in 09. And so we shot 65284s from there. So I I started sh shooting really serious then because we had to go to a lot of tryouts and, and all the major competitions. So it just kind of ramped up from there. Um, England was a was a fun experience. That was a great place to shoot, and the uh, facility there is pretty nice. And we had a good time. And of course, Tate probably told you some of those stories. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> we had a good time over there. And uh, now it's just kind of all I do. Uh, people ask me about hunting. Now I'm like, no, nah, for the price of a hunt, I could build a whole new gun. So, you know. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So, so you get you find you know like many of us you kind of start as a hobby and then it becomes pretty serious hobby yep exactly <laughs> uh the so you, you know so now you're on the u.s team right when 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 does the long shot start how does that happen because i mean that's well, a, that's a that's a you know for people that don't know how this works there is the national team the u.s rifle team and what you're trying to do you're trying to get on a what they call the the eight-man team you know, there's right. the, the main, when you compete at the world's nations compete against other nations, they have an eight man team format. Uh, but also at, at the local, I want to say local, at the national level, we have team matches. Like you go to the nationals and they have a team match. You can have up to seven members, but only four of them are shooting members. You can only have four people shooting at the same time. So obviously most of us have or belong to a four-man team because that's going to keep us multiple things. It keeps us obviously in, in, in interested in team matches and team matches are more fun than you can imagine. And, uh, and you need that experience if you're going to want to be on the, on the main team, on the eight man team, because you gain a lot of experience from team shooting. So pretty much everybody, you pretty much would say that everybody who's a top shooter belongs to a team of some kind, right? Yes. As far as I know, it's 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 almost it's not mandatory, but it's it's almost mandatory. Actually, to be on the U.S. rifle team, you you require team experience of some type. I'm not real sure the actual requirements, but I, I, I would what, highly recommend it. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, so you know, when when do the long shots start? Well, when we were in England in '09, that was when I first met Michelle Gallagher. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nancy and Michelle coached the Rutland team. That's what I shot on. And so I met her there. And of course, you know, we were there for two weeks and David Bailey and I met her there. And then Jeff Cochran played a lot, a pretty big role in putting our team together. He had the spindle shooters and he had kind of mentored Bailey and me somewhat when we first started. And so he kind of put this all together with me and Bailey and, uh, and Michelle, and then we added Ken Dickerman and Mark Walker. And so we first shot together as a team in 2010 at Nationals in Sacramento. Mm -hmm. And uh, we did okay. Walker couldn't make it that year. We had Andy Amber shot with us in his place. And mm -hmm. I think we finished third, which is nothing to sneeze at at a Nationals. And then it just kind of took off from there. We well, won in 2011 and again in 2012. We won 
national championship. Well, and not only that, uh, you guys also have the team record, which is yes. an 800. Yeah. An 800, that means everybody's shot clean. All yep. the four members shot clean scores. And you were the last one to shoot? Or no, I was the first one. You were I was the, the first one. Now, keep in mind, that was in 2014. And at that time, no one had shot clean in a team match at any distance. Right. Now, since then, there's been a ton of cleans at 600, but no one's cleaned 1,000. <laughs> yeah. But no, I shot first, and then uh, Bailey and Walker, then Dickerman finished it off, and that was I, – I, I, when when Ken was shooting, I couldn't watch anymore. His, <laughs> his cider shots – you know, he was shooting coated bullets, and he had a clean barrel, so his siding shots were just all over the place. Uh, and I watched for a little while, and I couldn't couldn't stand it, so I went to the parking lot. <laughs> and it peeked up over the wall every once in a while, and his wife was watching through a spotting scope, and I was kind of looking at her reaction. But Yeah. But plus, we were shooting in our Halloween costumes. So. I was going to say, uh, <laughs> I know for a fact it was Halloween, because you guys were shooting in Halloween costumes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, obviously you guys have fun, which which I think team matches, and I, I mentioned this, uh, they are a lot of fun. Once you ha find a group of guys that you can really click with, they can be a lot of fun. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes the only reason I'm going to nationals is because I'm part of a team and I don't want to let them down. Cause... Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's, I mean, I don't think any of our team went to nationals this year, but everybody pretty much said but if the team's going i'll go yeah yeah I'm, that becomes i'm planning on going but i'll go if the team's going. correct correct uh so you guys shoot an 800 uh well obviously did you guys win that year the nationals no the we team? no we won that was the first match we shot the 800 and then uh we dropped a few points on the second one and i think grizzly ended up winning that year. yeah but i mean a, a national record that stands until today uh, yeah, we got a couple of years ago. We got close. We shot a seven ninety nine, and we had you guys on Nexus. But that, oh yeah, I remember <laughs> at one point. <laughs> that I one do remember point. that after we shot the eight hundred, when we went to the second match, I was the first shooter, and I believe we only had two siders, and I shot those, and then first record shot nine, one on, and you could feel a collective sigh of relief <laughs> through, through everybody on the team. It's like okay, now we got that out of the way. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing what a nine would do, uh, especially the nine one on. That is so common. Yeah. Nine one on is so common. It's it's impressive, actually, to to see how common it is. Yes. Yeah. So, an eight hundred is four people shooting cleans, on a what I call the big stage, right at the yeah. nationals. Let's go back. It hasn't been that long ago when nobody was shooting cleans. No. I when remember your up. first clean. Yeah, I know you were scoring for me. <laughs> now, now, that was my first 200 clean. I right. shot 150 before. Right, well, yeah, when I, be, yeah, your 200. But my first clean. 200, yeah, I was in Phoenix. I was in Phoenix at the uh, at the Long Range Nationals. Not Nationals, the, the State Long Championship. Range, 2011. And uh, I was scoring for you. And, yeah. Uh, you shot a clean, and I thought, okay. And then you, you looked at me, and you said, I don't know how it happened, but you, I, you told me that I was your first one ever. And I said, holy crap, I, I didn't realize it. I don't know yeah. when I shot my first clean, but I don't remember the year, but it was at Texas State, and Michelle was scoring for me. It's, it's, I remember it. Uh, and she was, same deal, like, that's your first one ever? I'm like, first one ever. And like, wow, that's awesome. Yeah. But So, again, it wasn't that long ago when we were amazed to be shooting cleans. We just... And then all of a sudden, nowadays, you go and it's nice and calm and you don't shoot clean. You're pretty upset. Well, yeah. I mean, things have progressed in the last six, seven years so much. You know, used to, I've always said that a train wreck was a 192, 190. And nowadays, a train wreck is a 196. You know. Even, even, even more than that, actually. Uh, uh, for example... A couple of years ago at the Nationals, uh, Jay and Todd and Pat and all of them were contenders to win it. And Jay, we're all staying at the same house. So Jay just, well, you know how it is. Todd and Jay and all them, Pat, they were all 
right there, like one, two, three. And uh, Jay was leading. And that was at the Southwest Nationals. But he had quite a bit of excess on, on Todd, like quite a, quite a bit, like 10 of them. And he's like, well, I got 10 excess on you. So even if you tie me, I got you. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, the next morning, they both shoot cleans. But yet, Ta uh, Jay is pretty disappointed because he shot a clean with 10 X's. Well, Todd shot a clean with 18 <laughs> X's. Yeah, so all of a sudden, his, his big 10 X lead is pretty much evaporated. Yeah. So, so in that circumstance, a 200 with 10 was Jay's train wreck in his head. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's amazing. It's amazing because when he saw that Todd shot 18 X's, all of a sudden, the perspective changes like, Oh my God, right. I'm not shooting very well. <laughs> yeah. you know? So speaking of train wrecks, um, when was it? Uh, must have been 15 or 16. Uh, I shot a clean, 200 with 10. Uh, I guess it was burger. And then I shot a back-to-back -back clean, and I shot another 200. And that's not very common. I mean, it's very common to shoot a clean in the morning. But then to back it yeah. up with another clean, it's not very common. So I was pretty pretty happy. Yeah. And somebody asked me, said, how'd you do? I said, another clean. They're like, how are you doing for the day? I said, 200 with 20. I said, I've shot 210 twice. They're like, man, that's amazing. I'm like, yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. They said, yeah, Gosnell has 33 X's. I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, he's also <laughs> clean, but he's got 33 X's. I'm like, how? Yeah. Like... <laughs> And yeah. that's when you were just on fire. That was at Nationals in 15. Whatever it was. I was first, feeling pretty first good. First two, I shot a 216 and then a 217. Yeah, and I was 210 and 210. All of a sudden, that didn't seem very good at all. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, it's that's the, that's what I mean with the game, right? The game itself, hey, you know, I put up two cleans. It almost seems like it's easy, but yet you're over here almost doubled my X count. So, you know... Uh, that's just the name of the game. And and like I said, not long ago, we, we there was a handful of people that shot cleans. Yeah, yeah. When I started, Mike Downey had the record at 199.15, the national yeah. record. Yes, because, see, we, we changed over to the small target around that same time. Yeah. I think 2006 was the first time they shot the small target at national, uh -huh. and then ever since. But uh, so it took everybody a little while to get their game up on that little target and not only that right it's it's uh the 180 hybrid came along the, well, yeah. the seven millimeter the you know and then the 180 hybrid came along and i think the the 180 hybrid has really changed the game don't you think yep yep and uh and of course the 284s and you know just different reloading techniques or you know like annealing and and pointing and, and all these other things that people are testing and, and just making them better. Which uh, brings me to another thing that I remember when I did Jay, the Jay interview. He talked about how he used to do everything. I mean, everything to his ammunition. Yeah. And then you probably know where this is going. <laughs> kind of, sort of, but go ahead. <laughs> and then he goes to... Uh, Oh, they just had it over there this weekend. What what, what match did they have in uh, uh, Missoula? Missoula. He goes to Missoula. You're there, and he watches you shoot your national record. Uh, you're 217. Is that what it yeah, was? Yeah, was about a month month before nationals. Yeah. Right. So tell me how that went about, because that that was the first 217 ever. Yeah. Well, that match, I went up there intending to shoot records. Actually, I wanted to shoot a Palmer record and a thousand yard record because that range is the calmest place I've ever shot before. Mm -hmm. However, now with the caveat, when the wind does blow there, it's wicked. Mm -hmm. It's un almost unreadable, but uh, I didn't do great on the Palmer, but on the last day we shot all a thousand. It was just dead calm and I had a really good gun and I shot that string in about three minutes. <laughs> I wore that, that, had a guy in Pittsburgh, and I wore his, wore him out pretty good, I think. But 
yeah, it was just everything was just going in. I mean, well, and I started with I, my first two record shots were tens. Okay. My, so I shot three tens, and that was shots one, two, and ten, and then the rest axes. What uh, was that an exceptional barrel that you think, or or what was it? Well, you know, about a month later, then we went to nationals, and I shot two hundred sixteen, two hundred seventeen. And I ended up winning, but um, yeah, that was, I mean, obviously that was a good barrel. I had just the right load for it. Everything just kind of came together. But uh, after I retired that barrel, I, you know, I've, I've had several others since then. Mm -hmm. um, that was not the same barrel I wanted that used at Southwest Nationals, you know, 17. Right. So it was, it was not just the barrel, but certainly it had a lot to do with it. Now I shot some bench rest matches up in Missoula. I occasionally shoot thousand yard bench rests and I shot with that gun and did reasonably well against those bench rest guys because mm -hmm. those guys shoot really tiny up there in Missoula. But I did okay with it. Surprised a few of them, I think, with the 284, <laughs> you know. Yeah. You know, against those dashers and BRAs, whatever they yeah. whatever yeah. They, they, they shoot up there. So so you shoot your record up there, two hundred seventeen. And Jay said he had a talk with you, and he starts talking about your reloading <laughs> process. <laughs> and yeah. he's asking about, you know, sorting this and sorting that, and you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't do none of that crap. So, so tell us, <laughs> what is it that you do? Are you willing well, to disclose that? Yes. I mean, and it's actually evolved a little bit since then, but back in those days, I, I didn't do much of anything. I mean, I, I, I was... One, that first record was shot with brand new brass and fire. So virgin brass. Virgin brass. Um, Lapua brass? No. Okay. It was not. I, I, I saw the hesitation there. <laughs> yeah. But. Um, well, well, you can I, disclose, you, uh, disclose as much as you want. Okay. I don't, well, okay. I, well, when it comes to just, just the reloading process, in those days, I did. I preferred to shoot new brass. It's oh, it just seemed to shoot good for me, mm -hmm. and it went in and out of the gun easy. Now, mm -hmm. On occasion, I'd have some that was a little small, and I would get uh, I'd blow primers and whatnot, you know, headspaces uh -huh. issues. So I kind of then got to where I at least tried to once fire it before I before I did it. But I didn't have uh, you know barrels for fire forming, and I hated using my good ones for that. So I tried to stay away from it, but. I mean, I don't, I don't clean brass. Um, I don't clean primer pockets. I don't uniform primer pockets. When I got, a, you know, new cases, I would, I had to turn those, so I neck turn those, and inside and outside chamber, load them and shoot them. Yeah. Do you kneel? Never have no. You don't kneel. No, but I don't shoot my brass a lot, mm -hmm. and I've got a lot of it. I probably should. And I know it's all good stuff, but I just I have access to a a kneeler now that I could I may start doing that more. Okay. So yeah, so Jay said he talked to you and and he starts asking about uniform pockets. Like I don't do that. Cleaning bread, uh, I don't do that. You know, this yeah. I don't do any. I don't do anything. And yeah. uh, <laughs> that has, you know, I uh, well, you know, I was I was a, a home builder. I was in construction and I got to shoot less and less because I just couldn't afford all the time that was needed in the reloading room so one day right. I just decided you know what I'm just gonna go out and, and test and everything that doesn't matter I'm just gonna get rid of it get rid of it get rid of it and that's what I started doing I I full-length sized dirty brass because I figured you know what if I were out to die I'll just buy another die if it's gonna save me hours and hours and hours yeah I'll just buy another die and uh, I have yet to wear out the dye with dirty brass, which is whatever, you know. So I started doing that, and now I don't even clean my brass. And, oh, you got to clean your primer pockets. Well, I don't. <laughs> I, I don't remember the last time I cleaned a primer pocket. It's yeah, like, I don't either. Uh, maybe I quit. in the early days. So what I do now is... I actually I anneal my dirty brass just as it comes off the box I anneal it I, I lube it I full length size it 
I wipe it, I prime it. Well, actually, chamfer, deburr it, prime it, load it. Let's go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, I have a saying when it comes to all of our reloading stuff and preparation. I've always said that if you think it matters, it matters. And everybody has different comfort levels about what they're comfortable with. But the key to me is you can't go to the line with any doubt in your head. You know, you can't go out there and, man, I, I, probably, I wish I'd have cleaned this brass or I wish I'd have done this. or Because the first time you wing a shot out that's weird, that's that's the first thing that pops in your head is, man, I, I knew I should have done such and such. Right. And then after and that, so, it's downhill. And you can't, you can't go to the line with doubt. And <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Hang on one second. In um, 2015, that Missoula match, when I shot the 17, and then, you know, just a month later was the national. So I'm home and I'm getting blow ammo for both of those matches, actually. And so one day I was going to do, okay, today I'm going to do uh, my team match ammo for work or for nationals, which, I mean, I, I take pretty good care of all my loading, but team ammo is, it's a little bit extra scrutiny. And so, and I just needed 50. So I'm, I'm loading along and I get to the very last round and I look down at my powder measure dispenser that I use. And I noticed somewhere, somehow I had, Turned, I changed it, and I put in a grain too much. It was set a grain high. <clears throat> and I thought, great. Now, how long has it been like that? I don't know. Yeah. So I pulled the previous four bullets and measured the powder, and, and they were all the same, so it was just that very last one. However, now at this point, I'm, I've got down in my mind about that whole box of ammo. Even though I checked, you know, and mm -hmm. everything seemed to be okay, but uh, I had doubt about it. So that's, this is not team ammo anymore. And so I took that up to Missoula and shot it, and that's what I shot the 217 with. <laughs> 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 so I guess it was okay, but I had doubt. <clears throat> and so I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't keep but it to the team. It's a common thing, right? When, when, uh, when you have your loading block and, you, 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 and then you see the... the pile of or you know very slight pile of or a few kernels around your loading block yeah and then you look at it and you go where did that come from right exactly and that just ruined the whole block yeah you, you can't you can't see bullets because there's a few kernels laying there yeah so, yeah it's incredible and and that's correct uh, i i did not eliminate those things from my procedures until I tested them multiple times and proved to myself like, okay, cleaning primer pockets doesn't matter. Ah, good. Now I can eliminate it. So now I can load with hundred percent confidence. You know? Right. Uh, same thing with uh, not cleaning my brass before. Cause what I used to do is I used to clean my brass and kneel it, size it. Then I clean it again to get all the lube off, lube off the brass. And it was just, time and time and time the problem with cleaning i use wet tumbling media and uh you know i had to clean it and i only do it for about 20 minutes but then i had to dry the brass yeah and you know now a few hours went by where now in the same amount of time that it would take me to clean the brass i'm done loading right so yeah definitely sped the process up uh what about bullet prep do you do anything well i've always been a bit of a believer in sorting bullets but the only sorting i do is overall length base to tip now where did you get that well it kind of came out of the 2009 u.s team we were shooting the 140s and uh, i think one of our team captains came up with that he, he said that can sometimes cause a problem but but let me tell you the reason i sort like that is because i point well before you go any further on this, I want to make a point to our viewers. See, this is what happens when we tell you the truth. This tells you that we ain't, these guys are giving you everything they have. So it's up to you to, to believe it or not. But I mean, we interviewed Bob Bach and he told us how he came up with the overall length sorting and he found out that that's 
what mattered the most. That's now, where I got it from. I wasn't going to say his name, but it was Bob Bach. Well, yeah. Bob Bach, I interviewed him uh, uh, last week, and he told me about the overall length, and he discussed why he believed that. And remember, Mr. Bach has a uh, engineering degree. Very smart. And he's a national champion. National champion. Very smart man. And I don't know if you know this, but he invented the ultrasonic toothbrush. Seems like I'd heard that, but I don't <clears throat> Anyway, we talked about that on that episode. But anyway, so what I'm getting at is Mr. Bach talked about that. And uh, again, because I've told multiple people that to this day, because, of course, I learned that from Mike Downey, right? Yeah, he was on the team with us. He was on the team with you guys. (laughs) And now I've told some people the same thing. I'm like, well, just sort based overall length. And, of course, they think I'm crazy, right? But anyway, so continue. So you, you sort overall length. And this point well, and and sometimes I point, sometimes I don't. I'm actually I, I did that religiously for a long time, but now I've waffled a little bit. The the newer bullets are a little bit better than they used to be as far as the tips. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so I would point, um, and that's the reason, main reason I sorted them was because okay, I got this group that are within two thousandths of each other. So you could point that group together and not worry about overpointing or underpointing. You know, they all get the same point, amount of point anyway. Okay. And then I would keep the, all those to you know different batches. I sorted in groups of two thousands. Uh, but I still I still sort whether I point them or not. I still sort them for, and shoot them. Only shoot black bullets together. So you shoot short to long or long to short? Yes. <laughs> as long as they're together. Well, I, I'll end up with my zero. You know, if I sort a thousand bullets, you'll have a, a a big group right in the middle, and then a little bit smaller on each side of that, and then yeah, what I call the outliers. And the outliers end up coming fowlers or or uh, fire forming bullets, whatever. It's usually just those three in the middle. But you know, out of a thousand bullets, my center group, what I call the zero group, will be you know six or seven hundred. Okay, so that's going to be all your your uh, your match stuff. Your yeah. Exactly. Your big stage stuff. Yeah. So so you set a national record at Missoula cause with your wrong load. Well, it, it wasn't the wrong load. It was it was the uncertain load. Uncertain. Right. Uh, so obviously, that is the deadest, like you said, deadest range known Can to... Be. Can well, be. Can be. Okay. Can <laughs> be the deadest range known to, uh, to us as far that as... I've seen. Yes. As we know. So there has to be some, and you know how it is, like, oh, well, yeah, he shot, shot a record, but he shot in Missoula. So that almost, in a way, exactly. Does I mean, and, it and does I thought it, the same thing. You know, it was like, yeah, I shot a record, but it was in Missoula, and there was right. no Right, so in a so, way, it's like an asterisk, right? It's yeah. a national record, but it's it's an asterisk. So you go to Fast Red Zone. a month. You, and you I, go to a month later in Raton, and you do it all over again. All of a sudden, it's like... Okay. And I did it on the line with every other top shooter in the country shooting at the same time. So. I shot at 210 when yeah. you shot at 217. So, I, so scratch the asterisk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? Well, here's the amazing thing, right? Because to set a national record, it means it has never in history been done before. Yeah. And now you do it twice, two separate ranges... A month apart, undisputed, right? Yeah, I kind of validated it, yeah. Right. But then again, it's just amazing if you, you know, I don't know if you thought about it, but it's amazing how, it's like when Danny Biggs shot his 215. Yeah, he did it twice in two days. Well, it was the same day, wasn't it? Or No, it was, it was, uh, well, it could have been, I was thinking it was two different days, but I remember I watched. So he shot it, and everybody's like, yeah, it was dead calm. That and other then, one was. And then it's it's windy, <laughs> and they're like, wow, he just shot it again in the wind. It was windy, and everybody's dropping points, and he just shoots another 215. Yeah, I was scoring for Mark Walker, who was right next to Danny. So I, you know, I'm scoring, watching through the scope. And so I saw Biggs. Yeah. And I mean, and even he stopped for a long time because the wind flopped. Uh-huh. And he stopped for a long time, and then came back, but still continued on. And Got yeah. that 15. That was really impressive. Yeah. So so it's amazing how, I think it's amazing how that happens where 
you know, it's 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 never been done before, and all of a sudden, everybody does it. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't say everybody, but you know, multiple people do it. And then, of course, the two hundred fifteen, when that was shot, like, well, that's never going to be broken because that's that's an insane amount of excess. Well, then you come back with a two hundred seventeen, right? Yeah. And and now speaking of Missoula, this weekend two hundred nineteens were shot there. Yeah, two people shot at two hundred nineteen. Norm Harold and uh, Jeremy Smith. Yeah, nineteen X's. Wow. And guess what? Not even close to setting a new national record because Norm has it at twenty two now. Yeah, <laughs> which is insane. So then, fast forward to seventeen, where I was an eighth of an inch from matching that seventeen. Remember that. Oh, Lodi? Lodi. I was yeah. about that far. Actually, yeah. if I had started a shot earlier, I would have matched it. Yeah. If I had started two shots earlier, I would have beat it. But, you know, it's just just how that works. So, but then, okay, that's a national record. That's That's a great thing, right? One time. Well, you did it twice. But you know what I mean? It's It's one string, and it's over. But you also have the Palma record. Do you, does that does that one still stand? Yes, actually, I broke the Palma record three times. <laughs> um. So let's talk about that one because that was different in a, in the sense that it's not one match. Well, it's considered one match, but it's three, three stages. Three strings, yes. Three strings. You have an eight hundred fifteen shots, then you have a nine hundred fifteen shots, and then you have a thousand fifteen shots. Yeah. How, is that any different than the, just the one single 20? Well, actually, it's a little harder. I mean, because those three strings are spread out over several hours. Right. You know, so conditions change. And you'll see a, a lot of trauma matches. People will, sh- will clean the eight and nine and then drop points at a thousand. That's usually because well, that's a thousand. Yeah. And, and, but usually the wind is up by then, kind of thing, you know. Um, you know, it was a long time before anybody shot a clean. Ryan Pierce was the first one to do it, and he had shot a 450 with, I believe, 24 um, up in Lodi, I believe. And then it was several years later, I, I shot a 450 with 28 in in Phoenix. And then about a year later, a woman out in California tied that. Now, the one people don't know about is... Um, in, at the Arizona State Palma Championship in 16, which is in December, I shot a 450 with 30, mm-hmm. which was a new record. But, I mean, that just happened, and then we went to Southwest Nationals just two months later in February. And so, but at that point, when we went to Southwest Nationals, there had been four 450 shot, only four. Mm-hmm. And on Palma Day at Southwest Nationals in 17, there were four shot that day. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. But um, I managed, uh, I had 38 X's. I shot 150 13, 150 13, 150 12. And uh, so that one is, is still standing yet. The 38, that's 38 out of 45. Right. That means in all three stages, you only missed the X ring seven times. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. No wonder it still stands. Yeah. Well, now there's been several 450-37s. Yeah. Uh, there was a match in Phoenix a year, a couple of years ago that uh, s- several people shot 450-37s, and I, s- I saw Dan Bramley shoot a 450-37 uh, there like last year. Uh-huh. You know, so it, it, it's getting close. They're getting close. They're getting close. Conditions just got to be right. Yeah. Well... And, and the reason I asked about how is it different is because does the does the pressure build differently? Because you know, like I said, it, it's when when you're shooting twenty shot strings, and like you say, you shot in three minutes. You just shoot, and we're yeah. going to talk about that as well. But <laughs> shooting so fast, but in the Palma, you, you have no choice but to think about it, and people coming up to you and talking about it, and and this that and the other right and and yeah. it like you said most records are shot in the morning in a palma you have you literally have to shoot all day to get yeah. it done right so 
you don't shoot a thousand until late in the day. It's hot. Conditions are drastically different. Mirage is up. You're tired. Everybody been talking about how you can set a record. This, that, and the other. Yeah, how is that different? Been, been in the pits back several couple of times. Yeah, like and... I say, you're tired. And you're probably hungry and and just dehydrated if you're in Phoenix. It's, it's just it's just harder. Well, a lot of people don't like, will say they don't like shooting the Palma because it's too much moving and whatnot, and I understand that. Uh, but I always say that what I like about the Palma, is, especially at 800 and 900, is we get to, that's the only time we shoot on a bigger target. Right. You know, re- relatively, yeah, it's bigger than I. Well, I, I always tell people 800 is the is the easiest target in F class, and and yeah, it's good for your ego. Realize. That's what I always say. It's good for the ego. You yeah. Can shoot yeah. Big numbers at 800. Yeah, but it but, gets a little harder. But that thousand is is what always trips people up. Well, yeah, I mean it's a thousand. <laughs> yeah, and it's the last one of the day. So right. So, so again, you're no stranger to records. Um, is there after you shot your first? What was your first record ever? I don't know. I've got eighteen certificates. Yeah, that's... National River certificates. Now, some of those are duplicates, you know, civilian or open or whatever. But I can't remember for sure what what was my first one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I'll tell you my team national record story here shortly. But uh, I'm just wondering if there's something that clicks at some point, almost like the first time you shot a clean, right? It's like once you get yeah. that done, it's just like it becomes the norm you know or, or it becomes yeah. a lot easier yeah and I, I can't explain that either or why, why that is it's once you get over that hump then it's i don't know somehow maybe a little clearer but i don't know it's hard to explain well because like i said it's 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 almost it's one thing when you do for example you know oh david gosnell shot a 200 with 17. oh it can be done and all of a sudden how many people yeah. match your record multiple people I know one of my teammates, Pat Pat Scully, matched. Scully the, did it, and Keith Glasscock did it. Keith Glasscock. I mean, multiple people matched that record. Yeah. And then, of course, now Norm moved it up to uh, twenty-two, and now Norm, uh, Todd Hendricks shoots eighteen X's like almost like every weekend, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then now they shot nineteen X's. You know, it's it like I said, it just seems like once somebody moves it, everybody follows along, but. How do you become the guy to move it? And that seems to be, you know, what you're good at, you know? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, you just got to have the right gun and the right day and pick the right time to shoot. Well, well, you don't get to pick the time. (laughs) Well, I mean, during your string, when to shoot, when not to shoot. Oh, I see what you're saying. But I mean, for example, uh, I talked about this with, uh, with John Witten. And he says that to to be because you know he's a six-time national champion, so he's. But he said it took him a while to get the first one. And once he did, it's like okay, it's smooth sailing from there. Is there? He says you have to believe that you are better than you are. Like you literally have to believe that, and then it happens. And then you just keep moving that. Yeah, I can't. I, I won't argue with that. I mean, it, 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 you know, we get into the mental game, and there is a lot of mental game going on here. You've got to, like, it goes back to what I said you can't have any doubt. Okay. Yeah. I, well, for instance, like when we went to the V two match in Tennessee last year, I didn't do real well, but I remember I was talking to some folks, and you know, who's going to win or who can win, and I'm like, well, I've beat everybody here. Yeah. However, everybody here has beat me too. So, <laughs> but I yeah. mean, so it, it, you can't can't have the mentality that I can't beat so and so. He's too good. Right, right. You know, or I can't shoot this score because it's just I just can't. Well, you can, but you know, you just got to have your mind right, your gun right. Right, right. Uh, is there? Because, I mean, we know the guns on the line nowadays are just insanely good. Right. right? I mean, if you compare the gun of today, just an average gun, 
of today with an average gun of, well, you can compare an average gun today with the best gun 10 years ago, or even five years ago. And I think today's average gun is better. Well, yeah, and the shooters are better, components are better. Um, you know, seven or eight years ago, maybe, I, we go to nationals, I could have wrote down a list of names, maybe 20, 25 names. And one of these guys is going to win. Mm -hmm. Now that list is about 50 people. Yeah. It's, it's, everybody's gotten a lot better. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with information that's available nowadays, right? Yeah. It's, it's, go build the 284, you know, 180 hybrids, Lapua Brass, get you a Borden, a Bat, uh, Kelbley, uh, Stiller, yeah. you know, just one of those uh, top actions, Defiance, you know, get you one of those actions and get you a Brooks, Bardline, or Krieger. I'm shooting. I'm not shooting any of those right now, actually. Okay. <laughs> well, when did you, when you shot your records, is that what you were shooting? Your those children? were Brooks. Brooks, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, you know, I'm, I'm saying, you know, kind of the, the typical playbook. If you, if, you, if you build that, you know, you're, you're going to be there, you know? Right. Yeah. You've got the tools. Yeah, I mean that, that's a, that's a, what I'm getting at is that is your your playbook, right? Just if you just do that, you're gonna be shooting with the best of one. Yep. That's a proven setup. Once you get that working, eh, you can at, at that point experiment with other things. Exactly. But I mean, it's anyway. Like I said, it's it's fairly simple. Whereas ten years ago or even eight years ago, it was not as defined. I don't think. Right. Not as clear cuts, like do this. Um, all right, let's go, let's talk about your speed shooting now. <laughs> Cause that's okay. something you're, when, when you said pick when to shoot, uh, do you, so I interviewed, uh, uh, when I was talking to, uh, Gary Costello, 2009 world champion. Yeah. Of course you guys were three or three to a mound. Right over there. In, in a bit, well, in the uh, imperial matches, in the yeah, in worlds the we shot two, but okay, some so, imperials we shot three. Okay, so either way it was pair fire or right. triple fire, whatever they call it. But then Gary says that he comes to America in 2013, and he said, I think he said he was paired up next to to uh, Seabold, and he says. Seabold gets up the line with clean or something, and he's on his third shot. Yeah. And then he said that was just, for him, it was kind of almost intimidating to see how fast the American shooters are shooting. Yeah. So anyway, any time a fast shooter or fast shooting is brought up, your name comes up. Yeah. Because <laughs> you are fast. Uh, how did that come about is that a strategy a strategy that you uh that you decided works or 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 is that something that from ventures that you brought over what 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 did I, it? that all just kind of started when i very first started shooting when i was shooting fdr and i didn't know anything about wind and so it just made sense to me that i know where that last shot went and hopefully the winds can't change too much i mean basically a spotter chasing mm -hmm. uh, and then and so I, I got good at shooting fast just because that's kind of what I was doing. But uh, it evolves over time. People say, well, all he does is chase the spotter. Well, actually, no, that's not all I do. But, I mean, I do look. And yeah. I, 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 Mirage, I always had trouble with Mirage. Maybe it's because I just didn't have a good enough memory for what it looked like the last time I shot. But, mm -hmm. um but I do look. I mean, I, there's uh, when I shoot, I kick that case out, put another one in, and then I'm peeking up over the top of the scope, looking, waiting for the target to come up. Mm -hmm. But I've made my decision. By the time that car target's come up, I've pretty much made my decision what I'm going to do. Now, occasionally I will stop, and that always freaks people out when I do. You know, I'll stop for a minute, and to me, that's like an hour. But. Uh, <clears throat> This past week down at Raton was 
was really wicked wind-wise. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have one bad day of wind down there, but it was pretty much every day. It was really bad. I'm talking um, at five minutes of left on the gun and holding off the target on the left side. Wow. That's, that's, eight, <laughs> that's eight minutes. Yeah. And I almost shot a miss. Um, <laughs> that would have been hurt all over. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it was, uh, you know, I had five minutes on. I'm holding like a six left and shot a nine out the right. So I moved out just off the board. And then, you know, the very next shot, they were using the uh, Velcro, you know, for the scoring disc. And so that one for seven was right there on the left side waterline. And I shot right through that Velcro. <laughs> I've got it. They brought it to me because I, wow. I still got it. But it went from a right nine to a almost off the board left, you know, and that's how wicked it was. Did I ever tell you my my uh, Ireland story? My so so we're in Ireland, and I'm just <coughs> I'm the newest member on the U.S. rifle team, and we go to Ireland, and of course I'm trying to prove myself, right? Because I'm sitting down, you know, they have all these meetings, and they have. You know, I'm sitting down, and I have, you know, Jim Murphy, Larry Bartholomew. I have uh, 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 Larry Tate. Uh, I have, uh, I mean, all these guys that I've been reading about. You know what I mean? And this is yeah. 2011, so I'm fresh on, you know, I'm new on the stage. I mean, the reason I'm here is because Downey pretty much shoved me in there. Like, get in there. You know yeah. what I mean? And so I, I'm, so anyway, long story short, we're shooting the Palma. And I'm doing pretty good. I think I'm like two points down for the day. I'm, I'm up there with them. You know what I mean? And uh, we go to 1,000. And Brian Odie was watching because he needed one more member for the for the Creedmoor Cup. And it was between me and Tony Robertson. And he was going to watch to see who's going to put in. And, and the wind picks up. Like, I mean, halfway through the string, I'm only down. I think I'm clean. Eight shots in and I'm clean. And then the wind picks up, and of course, I stop. And I'm feeling all kinds of proud of myself for stopping because I saw the wind pick up. And when I say picked up, it went from like 20 miles to whatever. It, I mean, it was already very windy. Yeah. So I stopped, and I stopped, and I waited. And then I'm like, okay, the wind's back down. I said, but just, you know, back to what it was. I said, but uh, I said, I'm going to give it another ring just in case. You know, I, I can afford to shoot a four. It's okay. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to chance it and go out one more ring. I shoot, and they pull down the target, and it stays down, and it stays down. And you know what it's like. So finally comes up, and I barely clip the frame on the right side, kind of like what you just <laughs> described. Oh, I mean, so I, I, it comes up with a one. Oh, my God. And I'm, I'm laying there going, now I'm terrified. It's like, what, where do I go from here? Right? Yeah. What do I do now? Yeah. What do I do now? And then I'm like, so I wait and I wait. And now I'm, now I'm going, okay. The next shot, if I move out to compensate for that shot and I'm wrong, now I'm, I'm on the other side of the target. I might miss the whole target this time. But if, if, if I don't believe it, you know, what do I do? So, I, I mean, I'm just laying there. I'm a mess. I don't know what to do. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to go on another another ring and a half. And that's still going to keep me in the frame if, 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 if it died. But if it did it, it'll bring me in. You At least know, you'll hit the board. <laughs> I'll hit the board. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll probably hit a three or a four, you know. So that's what I did. I think I went two more rings. Or I, I, I bracketed. I, I said, I, you know, I won't hit less than a three on each side, you know. I made my decision, and I held far over again, and I shot, and I hit another one right next to it. Had I not moved the additional two rings, I would So it kept building. Yeah. And after that, I'm like, okay, I believe it now, and then I moved. And, and it, long story short, those last seven shots cost me like 10 points. Yeah. I was devastated. And, of course, the first thing I do, I get up, and I look back, and there's Odie on the spotting scope, and I'm like, oh. So I didn't know what to do. So I walked, I walked over there and I'm like, I don't know what to do. And you know what he told me? He's like, eh, you got caught on two shots. 
not that big of a deal. Yeah. And that just made me feel better. But at the same time, it, it just, holy smokes, man. It just, it was just yeah. terrifying. Those big wins, you know, angle change comes into play so much. Because just even a slight angle change in a big wind will is a lot. As far as bullet movement, and that's it's hard to hard to judge those. I mean, shooting fast in those conditions is not really the thing to do because it's changing so fast, and sometimes you win, sometimes you don't. Um, you know, I, I have another thing that I always say about how many times have you you're holding like say two and a half right, and you shoot a nine out the left. Okay, so I'll, I'll move to a three. And you shoot a nine out the left. Okay, I'll go to three and a half. And you shoot a nine out the left. And the whole time, what you're afraid of is shooting a nine out the right. Yeah. And, and I call it shooting three nines, trying to keep from shooting one. Yep. I mean, sometimes you, two and, that, two and a half, you shoot that nine, you get a choice to stop or go ahead and go to a four. Yeah. So I, mean, I discussed this with, uh, I think it was, uh, uh, I don't know who it was, but we discussed this very same thing where people was, sh they're okay shooting three nines downwind as long as they don't shoot one upwind. Yeah. And, and, uh, and I, I, you know, have you come up with any rules for yourself when you're shooting? For example, you shoot a nine downwind. What happens? What is, do you have a rule for that? What happens immediately after that? Well, it's always, you know, every circumstance is a little different, but. Like, let's say if I'm holding a right three and shoot a nine out the left, uh, I'll go to at least a four, maybe a four and a half, if and shoot, or uh, or you stop. Right. And so my my hard rule is, uh, if I shoot a nine, like you know, to your example, and, and, and like you said, every every it's difficult or it's all different, right? But if you shoot a nine, that means the wind's building, right? Right. So uh, my instinct, if I shoot a nine downwind, I immediately move two rings or I stop. Because exactly. the, the two rings, one ring is, is going to get me in the 10. And the Maybe. other ring, yeah, the other ring I needed to, to compensate for, the, for what it, whatever it built from the last time I shot, right? Right. So two things are going to happen. Either I'm going to be right and I'm in the center somewhere in the 10 ring. Or I'm wrong, and now I just shot a, a nine upwind, which now I'm at least I bracketed the wind, and I, now I know where I'm at. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. But multiple times, just nine, nine, nine. Yeah. And it just, just, yeah, it just kept yeah. happening. You hear it all the time. People say, "I shot a nine, so I moved a little, and I shot another nine right next to it. So I moved a little and shot another nine right next to it." Well, you got to go. You either got to. Just have the guts and move on out or not and stop. Well, the reason that happens is that's what's known as to be getting behind the wind. Exactly. You, you, you're you actually moving exactly. The problem about this is you are correct. You are reading the wind correctly. The problem is you're already behind it because, you sh you know, if you were in the X yeah. and you were doing that, you'd be in the X the whole time. But you hit a nine and that's what made you move. But all you're doing is compensating for the error. You you got to get in front of it. <laughs> but it's really hard yeah. for people to move when they're in the X ring. Isn't that yeah. right? Like you're you're hitting X's, and then you see something, but you're like, no, I was an X. I'm just gonna stay there. And boom, you hit a nine, and then you compensate. Yeah, the the last string I shot uh, down at Raton the other day was was really windy, and uh, well, I started out shooting. No wind on the gun, holding the left three, and it was a good wind, good call for windage. And this is during siders. And then during the course of that string, I worked all the way out to uh, five right. And then, and I kept shooting, I kept shooting tens at three o'clock. And so I'd come in a little, shoot a ten at three o'clock, and I'd come in a little, shoot a ten at three o'clock, <laughs> and I finally got in where I was holding like a right two and a quarter. And it scared me to death because the mirage was still looked like it was doing this, but that's where they kept going. So you yeah. got to go with what they're saying. But I, I shot it. I cleaned it. And that was one of my better cleans I would probably ever shot was in that because of that wind. It was, How, it was Do you ever safe side or are you trying to shoot X's? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Which yeah, I'll one? safe side. 
that's I mean that was kind of what was going on there. I was afraid to come in. Well, that's what I was asking. You were just playing it safe, so so you weren't shooting for the X. You were just saying, you know, at any point this thing's gonna die and it's gonna move over or pick up. So yeah, I was afraid it was gonna pick up. Yeah, so you're you're staying on the low end. Just if it picks up, it gives you the full ten ring, or right? You know, three quarters of the ten ring to be wrong. Um, but again, there is a time to save side, and there's a time to just go for it. Yeah, uh, and course. there's time to, to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and <laughs> the good shooters, the difference is they know when to do which. Well, exactly, exactly. I mean, I'm as guilty as anybody else about not moving, you know, shooting three nines or whatever. Well, I'll usually I'll stop by then. But, but I mean, we all do it, but uh, I just got to try to remember it either. Either go ahead and move it out there or, or quit, you know, just stop. Yeah, uh, it's, it's. Uh, I wonder why we get paralyzed so, so, so bad. Because that, that's, that's the only thing I can compare it to is just getting paralyzed by the, uh, is it the fear? <sighs> I don't know what it is because it's you literally get paralyzed. You want to move, but you don't. You know, you, you sometimes I, I find myself like I'm gonna go two rings, and I'm about to pull. It. I'm like, no, no, no. So I move in to one, and then, then I shoot a nine down win. The the, yeah. the the first one would have been right, but somehow you, I get paralyzed when when you want to push it out. Well, I'm just moving a lot is is unnerving to move a lot from your previous shot. Right. You know? Because I guess it's that's some doubt we all have about our wind reading abilities. Yeah, it looks bigger, but you know, I, I don't know. Well, and, and of course, the, the worst thing that sometimes happens is the shot goes exactly where we're pointing, right? Yeah. <laughs> the shot went right where I was holding. Well, well, that's an easy one. Then you move in and hold center and rip them. <laughs> exactly. But it's, it's, uh, it's just amazing how, and this goes back to the mental game, right? It's right. like we know what we need to do, but yet we don't do it because we're afraid. Yeah. It's like, it's it's right there. The data supports that you need to move two rings. But yeah, I better not. And then just keep pounding. That just, seems, that just seems too much of a move to make in one shot. You know. So Canada, 2017... On the last day, I decided, I was 19th place, and I decided 19th or 50th, it doesn't matter. I'm going for it. And on the last string of the day, when it was really windy, remember that? It was just horrendous. And of course, we're pair firing. I'm moving two to three rings per shot. Just yeah. out and in and out. And of course, you know, they were about a minute apart, minute and a half because pair firing. Whatever, however long it was... So I would look, make a call, and I said, I'll just move. And I I figured if I tank it, I tank it. It doesn't matter. And I only dropped. I was down two points with only one shot to go. And on the last one, I went three rings, I remember. And I thought, oh, man, I'm probably going to hit a four-up wind. You know what? No, no, I better keep it safe. I moved in a ring. And then I thought, if I drop another point, I'm okay. I just I don't want to drop two. So I moved in, and guess what? I dropped a point. Downwind. If I would have just went with my initial, it wouldn't have mattered. But the point is, I just decided, hell with it. And it worked out. But most of the time, it doesn't. Right. <laughs> and, of course, that 19th, because of that one string, I went from 19th to 5th. And it was over, which I'm, part of me was glad. But uh, sometimes it just, you know what it's like. Sometimes you're shooting. And you have no idea. What do you do then? Like, you just hope it's over? Sometimes, yeah. <laughs> just shoot faster? Yeah. Well, you know, in the big winds and in, in Mirage, I have a lot of trouble with Mirage. Um, my vision is not very good right now in my shooting eye. You know, I've got a cataract in my right eye, and that's what I shoot with. And, of course, I put a patch over my left eye, which sounds totally ridiculous but that's just the way i do it but and then when the mirage gets up i have a hard time with vertical but um in those big wins i mean it's like we had a rat tone i shot some horrific scores uh, i shot a, in the palma first day of the palma that we shot i shot a 411 
<laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> wow. I mean, I was I, about let me too. tell you why I laugh. Because if somebody had told me that you shot at 411, I would have never believed them. You know what I mean? Yeah. In, in the thousand yard string, this is just 15 shots. I think I shot a 123. <laughs> at a thousand. Wow. Yeah. That is. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, uh, what was his name that uh, from from West Texas that uh, used to shoot with Ben Milam and all them? Freddie? Freddie. Freddie Haltom. Uh he used to say that he had the the record for uh, most nines in a in a fifteen shot string. He he shot fifteen nines. <laughs> <laughs> he said yeah. nobody has ever shot more nines than him in a in a in a in a fifteen shot string. He shot fifteen. I would I would have taken fifteen nines. Right. It's, <laughs> I was shooting a, sevens and fives and sixes. And... It's it's amazing how sometimes you just lost in in everything piles on right so you get lost and all of a sudden you feel at least for me i feel more tired and i just feel like f this i just want it to be over and then i start to shoot faster and and just kind of rip off the band-aid and 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 it just it just again back to the mental game right you just you just yeah. check out and you're like you know i just want this to be over yeah that you helps know it's 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 impressive how or it's incredible how how often that happens and when i talk to shooters how the same they they had pretty much everybody has the same experience and and the, sure. the the more frustrated you get the your scores are gonna just gonna yeah tank because you don't want to be there after a while you just don't want to be there you don't want to shoot yeah it's every every decision i've made so far has been wrong so i i don't know what to do now <laughs> yeah so when when you encounter a condition that you're doing pretty good in and it changes and now you look down there and, and you don't know what to do. Is that a, a good time to stop or? Yeah. That's well, that's when you, hopefully if others around you are shooting, you, you can, you know, you watch their targets. You know, I, I think it's building, but, and I'm not going to shoot. So let's see what this guy does. And, you know, and if his goes way out, yeah, well, I was right. It's, it's building. So I'm going to, you know, watching other people's targets is a, is a kind of important because you, you can get a good idea. And ideally, if you're shooting with someone who's, you know, a good shooter, you're all kind of doing the same thing anyway. And so if you stop and watch them and they suddenly wing one way off the left, you know, something changed. Mm -hmm. So I neither need to adjust for that or I got to stop. And hopefully somebody will shoot a sire for me, you know. Yeah, that's uh, Seabolt kind of got this rule into me. Uh, it's it's his rule. Then I kind of stole it and I use it as my rule now. When I don't know what's going on, I stop, right? And kind of like you said, I start watching my neighbors. But if they hit three X's in a row, I jump in. It's tough not to go when they're doing that. Yeah, you don't because what, you don't know what they're doing, but still. But it's stable it, enough that they're doing that. It, yeah, you say, okay, I don't know what they're doing, but at least I know it's stable. So I'm going to take a cider. Hopefully, I'll, you know, when we say cider, it's, it's for record, but we call it a cider because we don't know what we're doing. So we jump in and hope hope to hit a 10. And by whatever it is that you hit, you just compensate off of that and you rip it. And then you go, yeah. Yeah, So so, you know, it's just all kinds of different strategies that... Uh, that are employed. Um, <laughs> where does the name Ninja come from? The nickname. <laughs> You're known as the Ninja. Why? Yeah. Well, you know, and it's it was just an off the cuff remark. Actually, how I started all. It was in uh, at Phoenix at Southwest Nationals, and I believe 2011. Yeah, the match was over, and I was down in the parking lot putting stuff in the back of my pickup. And David Mann is walking across the, the firing line and he stopped and pointed his camera at me. And I, and just off the top of my head, I said, David, don't bother taking my picture. I won't show up. I, he said, well, I said, hey, I'm a ninja. All you'll get is a little wisp of smoke. <laughs> and that's how it started was with that, you know, just some off the top of my head. And he just thought that was the funniest thing ever. And, and away we went. Away you went. <laughs> that's so how it started. 
that's how you became the ninja. Yep. Yep. <laughs> that's awesome, man. Well, David, this has been a lot of fun, man. This, uh, uh, what, uh, before we go, what, what, uh, what would you say? Well, I have two questions. Okay, we're not ready to go yet. Coded bullets. You mentioned coded bullets with Dickerman. I made a note down here to ask you about yeah. it. Because coded bullets is something that it was a fad, right? It's, a lot of people were doing it, and all of a sudden nobody's doing it. Yeah. What do you think about coded bullets, and what happened with that? And, and Well, in Ken's case, he was using that. I forget the exact name. HBN, the yeah, HB, warm nitrate. Yeah, white stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it changes your load. you got to bump up the powder and whatnot because they're really slick. Um, and in Ken's case, if he had a clean gun, he had to shoot a lot of ciders to get it to calm down. I mean, like 10 or 12 before it would fly now. And we shot molly coat bullets back in uh, before we went to England we were shooting them because that's when they started having trouble with the one we were shooting six five two eighty fours and those one forty VLDs were blowing up sometimes. And one of the ways around that was the Molly coat. So we did that but uh, after after that and then they came out with the thick jackets and then the hybrids and whatnot. So it kinda of went away. But I've never shot coated bullets except for during that that time and uh, just getting them all the same see being an issue you know depending on who coats them and how you coat them i'm i'm not a real fan of coated bullets uh, and that's just my personal opinion some people do i guess do well with them but ken finally got away from it but uh that was the big thing I, that i saw was he had he had to shoot a lot of fowlers if you will yeah to get, yeah. To get it back out. so if you had to tell something to a new shooter what what would you say you know just one piece of advice Oh boy! Mainly, don't worry about winning that first match or the second match. Just go out and shoot and learn. And and the F class community has always been really good about you know. You come and ask me a question, I'll answer it to the best of my ability. Um, but just go and shoot. Go to go to matches uh, wherever you can. You know, we have we shoot mainly six hundred yard matches here locally, but we we'll get some new shooters and. And that's the key is just go out and shoot and try new, try something different. <clears throat> you know, get out of the comfort zone a little. Yeah. One last one. Uh, I need you to nominate someone that you think I should talk to. It, it doesn't have to be somebody I know. It's just somebody that you think I could learn something from or, or the viewers could learn something from talking to that person. Well, have you talked to Michelle? No, but she's on the list. But I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll just, yeah, that's uh, for sure. You know, <laughs> just found yeah. the knowledge. Um, I, I guess I should have thought about this beforehand. I might have could have come with a name better, but I mean that's as good as any name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Michelle or Nancy, either one. Yeah, yeah, awesome. Well, David, again, thank you very much for doing this. And uh, I know a lot of people are going to find this very useful. I know I did. <laughs> okay. All right, man. Thank you. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.